everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Emily Sprenger. I'm an academic trainer for the Center for Teaching and Learning, and I'm very excited to have our um, guest speaker return for a second time. I'd like to introduce the head of state for the nation of Hawaii, Dennis Keiki Bumpy Kanahele. And today's webinar is really focused on um, the nation of Hawaii 3.0 technology, the future, and government on a blockchain. And then there are a few special guests on both sides of Bumpy, so I will let them introduce themselves in just a moment. Just a few housekeeping things. Remember this webinar is being recorded and we are going to post it on our CTL webinars page, uh, especially for all of the people that registered that maybe couldn't be here right at this time. Um, the chat is open, so please feel free to participate there. And any questions that you might have, please put them in the Q&A function of your Zoom, and then we can address those as, as there is time. And one last tiny snippet, I wanna just uh, thank Dr. Edward Maggio for again introducing Bumpy to the CTL and providing us this great opportunity to share his knowledge um, with all of you in our community. So I will pass this over to Bumpy. Hi, aloha. Aloha and thank you for having us. Thank you, um, NCU, for uh, making this, this possible. Emily, thank you uh, for putting this together. Edward, um, mahalo uh, for keep pushing us to, you know, get things on time uh, done. But anyway, aloha. Um, we're excited. Uh, I have, you know, our deputy head of state to the right of men, and one of our executive advisors in communications and technology um, here today with with us. We kind of like doing this sometimes uh, together, uh, so don't mind, you know, the tree is a crowd kind of thing. But I, I think you're going to enjoy what we have to share you know, with you today. Um. With that said, I would like to start with uh, I would like to start with uh, this is who we are, um, and I would like to start with the the first. Uh, well, let's go on to the the, the next screen. The Ahupua system. Uh, to the Hawaiian people, to us in particular, the nation of Hawaii, um, it is an ancient blockchain network that, that we had, you know. Um, in the apology law, public law 103-150, uh, whereas prior to the arrival of the first Europeans in 1778, the native Hawaiian people lived in a highly organized, self-sufficient, subsistence social system based on communal land tenure, with a sophisticated language, culture, and religion. And, and um, that is in the law that is recognized by the United States uh, President, Congress, everybody. Uh, and then let's take a look at what it used to look like. Uh, so prior to the arrival, this is how uh, the Hawaiian people lived. This is uh, our society. Uh, where, you know, it fell in that order. Sky, the forest, the plain, uh, down to the streams and down to the shores, out to the ocean. Um, and on the right side, you can pretty much see like uh, a picture of how that society might have been like, uh, of course, before the destruction. And then next, please. When you look at the Aupua system in America from north to south, the Mississippi River was probably like Waimanala stream for us. It was, um, you know, peace, navigation, friendship, commerce had to have taken place up and down that stream. It still does, uh, the river still does today. Mm -hmm. The idea was to show uh, how strong or, or the foundation of the Ahupua system. 
in every continent, in every geographical area, they have some part or the whole part, like in our case, in our islands. Uh, we can see the ocean where our stream, Waimanala stream, the water goes out. Um, you can't see yours. You can't see the end of where your stream or your rivers end. And so I think, you know, Hawaii has more than just, uh, uh, you know, a, a few things to share. MIT, we have, we've been working with uh, Professor Todd Reed, uh, Capital Bank, uh, Yosef, um, Just Wallet, Hamilton Chong, and then we have Raul Gut uh, Goodness, uh, our Director of STEM, and John Garcia here. Um, <clears throat> it, it leads into, um, we, we are always uh, looking at like, keep into um, a format, a formula. And so we look at the political, economic, social, and cultural conditions or rights of an individual, uh, that individual as a family or as a government. And so in our case in Hawaii, the political structure was destroyed in 1893. And we recognize that in 1993, when they passed uh, US Public Law 103-150, that gave us the opportunity, the Hawaiian people, the opportunity to restore uh, what was damaged or what was taken away prior to the law being uh, mandated. And so in that restoration process, it was a convention held the next year that eventually uh, put us in what we call a reconciliation mode uh, with government. And mind you, this was a long time ago. Uh, but what we have on, on our uh, agenda is uh, to move into elections. Uh, the Hawaii Constitution uh, calls for a general elections process um, and to build our citizenship base. Uh, and that's our political uh, situation or political structure. No, I just mind you, we are under occupation. Uh, according to the law um, in 1993, we are under military occupation. Um, but <clears throat> we have, have learned to, to, like that last term, reconciliation, uh, we are uh, working towards uh, reconciliation in a whole different way unorthodox that, that yeah. we call it actually. Okay, John. Now on the uh, <clears throat> economic uh, status or economic base, we also recognize that, um, you know, that a building a finance, a financial institution was really, uh, as we put it at the top of the Ahupua system. And uh, economically, um, we have relations with, with Capital Bank. Uh, uh, we have a memorandum of understanding. Uh, uh, also, uh, Yosef is uh, also a Council General, an honorary uh, Council General representing some of these uh, countries. Uh, we're in a relationship with uh, uh, Just Wallet, uh, has to do with solar energy and and financial uh, uh, instruments. Um, I wanna actually go back to what I was talking about, the Ahubwa system. When that system flowed from the mountain to the ocean, um, what that system provided was a sustenance, a, a self-sufficient, subsistent social system that was based on communal land tenure. 
So it operated, when you turn on a faucet on the top of a mountain, that faucet cannot close or any parts of that uh, plumbing, your, your pipes going out, cannot be deterred in any way in order for the, the society to survive. And that was the Ahupua system as we see it as uh, the ancient blockchain uh, system. Now, the first uh, category was political. Now, if you put the political uh, condition on the top of the mountain and its job is to represent all the way down to the shore, through the shorelines, to the coastlines, the representation of the people that are under this political system. Now, if these guys are corrupt on the top, you're gonna have a big problem. And this is why, you know, in, in the democratic system, you try to put the best people in and, um, you know, but we see the Ahupua system politically. Now we're talking about the economic base for the nation. Well, the economic base and what should be on the top of the mountain for the Hawaiian people would be a financial institution. Why? Because those that exist today does not benefit Native Hawaiians in Hawaii. And throughout the world, all indigenous, native, aboriginal, original peoples are getting shafted in that area, financial institution. We need to have our own so we don't go back begging for it. And this is how our relations started, you know, get some good banks out there, financial institutions out there that, that you know, hey, this, they see the truth and justice uh, in, in our issue. And so we've managed to at least build that relationship uh, to the point where, you know, there's enough trust uh, to understand that, wow, you know, we, we're onto something really good that we wanted to, to work. Uh, and, you know, our, our, our vision is that every citizen of the nation of Hawaii uh, would be a shareholder of that financial institution. Uh, it's it's something that um, you know people talk about ESG, people talk about SRI. Well, we want to put that into practice. We want to use that and 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 uh, and share the wealth with all people, with all citizens. And if that means all the citizens that live in Hawaii today, which is over 1.5 million uh, people, then that's who's going to own it. And so this economic base and, and utilizing the ancient uh, system as a, a, you know, a template, you know, it's a template, it's a, what would they call it? Boilerplate uh, contracts, you know, you call it, you name it. The Ahupua system can help guide us back, uh, at least somewhat back physically in some cases. We can restore a lot of Ahupua back to its, its you know, or back to better conditions. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that is uh, uh, really important because um, with, a, with a strong economic base, on the top of the, the mountain and, and opening full flow to all the different types of possibilities uh, to improve the economy for that system uh, without any you know, obstructions or barriers of any kind. Uh, that is what the nation wants. That, that is what we want. And, and we can use the help and the expertise like a lot of the people that we're sharing with you are uh, their names. Um, and with, with, you know, we're gonna use that, we're gonna keep sharing that because not only was it a system, when, when it came to the social side of the Aupua on top of the mountain, it, might have, it must have been unbelievable. I, I keep thinking about America. I keep thinking about that travel down the Mississippi River. And I'm starting to read some old uh, books on tribes that were around the Louisiana area on the bottom side of this Mississippi River. 
And it just amazes me on, I, I, I kind of dream of what the relationship might have been like up and down that stream until prior to the arrival of the foreigners. So um, with that said, and, and keep in mind, you know, that we are always gonna come from that structure of the Ahupua system, which, you know, runs from a mountain to the ocean. And, and um, you know, we wanna get that back in, in to its form, at least where we can. And this is, you know, this is time to pass it on to Brandon, um, who's been a big part and a big push in building our nation to the next level, you know, for the next generation. So Brandon. Yeah, thank you, uh, Uncle. Um, aloha, my name is Brandon Makaabava. I'm the Deputy Head of State of the Nation of Hawaii. And uh, you know, I assist uh, uh, our head of state and a lot of the matters that we deal with as a nation, the building of our foundation. Um, you know, one of the things we're working on right now is kind of building towards, you know, what what the head of state was talking about and building an economic foundation for our people, which starts with our own financial institution. But I, I kind of want to talk about an issue that, you know, um, we've been dealing with for, for over 27 years and, um, it's this commitment that Bank of America made to the Hawaiian people back in 1994. Um, back then, it, uh, Bank of America was trying to come into Hawaii and so they took over a bank that was here. And so at that time, um, an organization called Napoe Kokua, which was uh, made up of uh, kupuna or elders um, and along with um, Uncle Bumpy and the nation, along with Ian Chan Hodges from um, other organizations, they came in to kind of uh, put a stop to this merger because uh, we found evidence that, that the banks here weren't treating Hawaiians equitably and also Filipinos. And they were doing something called redlining. And so when presented with this information, the Federal Reserve ordered uh, Bank of America, in order for them to merge with this bank here in Hawaii, that they would have to make this commitment to our people. And so this commitment was for $150 million in FHA 247 loans that were supposed to be given to Hawaiian homestead beneficiaries between 1994 and 98. Well, um, this commitment wasn't made. Um, and in 98, they tried to merge with another bank called Nations Bank. And again, uh, we intervened in that merger and brought up that this commitment has still not been made. Um, at that time, they only made $3 million in loans and for, you know, well short of the $150 million. So we intervened one more time. And, but at this time, um, what uh, the nation of Hawaii, what our head of state and um, the people that we worked with, with Napoi Kokua, kind of put forward a plan that, you know, in order for us to be all right with you moving forward, we would, you know, need you to recommit to this $150 million in loans because these were loans that were, you know, desperately needed by our people. Um, we have a Hawaiian homestead waiting list right now of over 28,000 Hawaiians that cannot get onto their lands because of the lack of loans that are being given out by banks here in Hawaii. And so they agreed, again, Bank of America recommitted to this commitment in 98, but they also committed to helping um, us create a Hawaiian owned and controlled bank, which every Hawaiian would be a shareholder in this bank. And, um, you know, that was, a, that was a huge kind of move for us because we're trying to build economic independence. And the only way you build that is you got to start at the top. And usually when it comes to economy, and if we stay true to this Ahupua system, the bank is the one that helps to kind of establish the flow of where funds are going throughout our community. And so, you know, where we were having problems with other banks giving us loans, stopping the flow to us, our bank would be different. It would open up the flow to us so that we could get loans, right? And so the bank agreed to help us. And, um, you know, we've been working with them for years. And then you fast forward to 2007, 
And um, the bank was actually illegally allowed to get out of this commitment by an administration here at the state of Hawaii. Um, this was at the time where the commitment was kind of taken out of our hands and, and put into their hands. So it, it went sideways. But, um, you know, currently we, we got them back on track. We actually got uh, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands in 2012 to actually say that that 2007 letter that Mike Akane and Ben Henderson, you know, told Bank of America that their commitment was done was um, not accurate and that the commitment still stands today. And so today, you know, we've been spending our time kind of going after Bank of America, making sure that they hold true to these commitments because you know, this is not just a Hawaiian issue. This is an issue that happens to indigenous peoples all over America. This is an issue that happens to black, uh, Latino, Asian communities, all oppressed communities that have these commitments um, that just mean nothing to a lot of these banks and nobody holds them accountable. Well, the Hawaiian people are holding Bank of America accountable to this commitment. And what we want to do when we finally reach a settlement, because you know we're not in the business of trying to fight a bank for the rest of our lives. What we're trying to do is establish something for our future, establish our own sovereign wealth fund, establish our own bank for our people. And so that is our plans for what we want to do with this money. Once we finish this settlement and we bring Bank of America back to Hawaii to, to make this right and to reconcile with this injustice that has gone on for so long, um, is to finally create that financial institution for our people. So, hey, what is the amount that they owe the Hawaiian people after 25 years? After, well, you know, like like all things, right? When when you know when you don't pay your bill, we won't bank. When you don't pay your mortgage, you get interest, right? And you get charged late fees and all that. And back in 1998, we actually charged Bank of America one late fee. And that is how we got them to commit to helping us create a Hawaiian bank. So they committed to provide $3 million in matching funds to create this Hawaiian bank. So going off of that, um, going off of that equation, what we came up with was uh, a figure around roughly between 600 million and $1 billion in uh, late fee that we believe Bank of America owes to the Hawaiian people for the lost opportunity of having these loans uh, be given to our people. See, back in 1994 and 98, if, if we had these loans, um, over 2,000 Hawaiians could have had homes and built equity. And these are things that um, we weren't given at that time. So, you know, the bank, we feel, has an obligation to um, reconcile these things. So. That's kind of the settlement that we're looking at. And so we're, you know, we're going about it in different ways politically, um, trying to get our senators involved, getting our governor involved to, to bring Bank of America back to Hawaii. And even on our own organization, I'm now the president of Nakoi Kokua. So we've hired our own lawyer. His name is Bruce Jacobs. He uh, fights banks that are fraudulently foreclosing on people all across America. Uh, banks like Bank of America and Chase. And so we've retained him as our lawyer and we're actually going to go through the process of suing Bank of America. And um, we're going to sue them on RICO statutes if they keep messing around and not coming to the table and settling with us. So, you know, these are just issues that we're dealing with here. You know, they're problems that, that need to be addressed, but there's a solution at the end of this. You know, we're not just fighting, um, you know, just to fight. We're fighting because commitments that, that, you know, have been made to our people have been broken so many different times that we need to um, correct that. And these banks have to make good on these commitments, not just to the Hawaiian people, but this is something that all people got to understand is when the banks mess up and the banks don't fulfill these commitments, who holds them accountable, right? And, and Brandon... I'm so yes. sorry that Brandon, um, I'm going to keep my camera off just because my internet's a tad bit unstable, but I'm so glad you mentioned who's going to hold them accountable because um, one of the questions that came up in the chat is, are there any consequences for the for Bank of America if they fail to honor their commitment this time? 
If yes, what is it? What are the consequences? And how will they be held accountable for failing to honor their commitment? Wow, that's a good question. Okay, well, you know, in the in the very beginning, what um, the people that hold the banks accountable is actually the Federal Reserve and the and the regulators, the Office of the Comptroller. So, um, you know, in previous administrations, um, the regulators were real friendly and chummy with Bank of America. But now because if there's a new administration, um, there's a chance to get new regulators in there that, that aren't uh, necessarily of that same ilk. And so they're, they're actually very pro um, people uh, self-determining their economic future. And one of these ladies that uh, we are supporting, her name is uh, Marissa Broderon for OCC chair. And so we're hoping that MRSA gets in because she can kind of be that um, regulator on the governmental side, you know, and we, we're keeping our fingers crossed. But at the same time, um, if that doesn't work, um, the, the onus is left on the people. You know, sometimes we have to either protest or, or even um, get our senators. You know, right now we have Senator Schatz, who is the... Um, uh, Indian Affairs Chair Committee person. And so what we've talked with him about in his office is bringing Bank of America to Capitol Hill um, for a hearing as to why commitments like the Hawaiian commitment hasn't been done and, and pretty much kind of, you know, shame them into getting this commitment done. You know, these are, these are the two options. The first option would be if the regulators did their job, right? But that don't always happen. And so the other part is the political side. But if we do have a good regulator that comes in, what actually happens and what, what can actually push Bank of America to fulfilling this commitment is um, they can put sanctions on Bank of America. From the time the commitment started till now, every day that the commitment is not done, um, possible sanctions go from $100,000 a day to a million dollars a day. So if you count from 1994 to today, that's a lot of money. So instead of paying these sanctions, um, the bank has the opportunity to settle with us because the sanctions gonna be in the billions and trillions if, you know, if the regulators stay to the T of the law and regulate on these banks. So these are our two options. It's, it's the regulators and then it's us, you know, the community and the politicians working together to just call out Bank of America and call out these other banks that you know fail on these commitments because the banks make commitments all the time. Last year they committed to doing a 1.2 billion dollars for um, uh, black-owned businesses because of Black Lives Matter and all of these things, but these aren't um, being kept track of, and so that's kind of an issue that that we bring into light now is that these banks kind of just go around making these fake commitments and not fulfilling them. So there's things that we are doing here that that'll help all Americans, you know, and, and all peoples when holding banks accountable. But, you, you know, I wanna add one more thing. The accountability is also to our state agency. Yeah. Because the state agency was confused. When you get somebody, a uh, uh, state uh, director, of Department of Home, Home, Hawaiian Homelands saying one thing, then years later, a director of Hawaiian Homelands come in and said, no, it wasn't fulfilled. Then you get the governor to come behind that six years later. The, the point is that, yeah, the regulators um, gotta be involved, but then also the people here running the, the offices that's supposed to be taking care of the beneficiaries, like Hawaiian homes. So there's, there's, you know, can I, can I blame one? You know, a whole bunch of them lined up that we got a whole accountable so that we can reach, uh, finally, somebody that can hold things accountable from their end. Yeah, so this problem, no, no start, you know, like, like our uncle was talking about, when you get bad politics at the top, that's, um, that, yeah. that's that's what happens with us, right? And then that's what's been happening here at the state of Hawaii. And so, you know, we're trying to correct these things, kind of being in line with the Ahupua'a system. And so, 
But thank you for um, listening to our story about Bank of America and you know just getting a little bit background information on our plans of creating our own bank afterwards and building off of economic independence. Now I'm gonna pass it on to John Kelo Garcia, who is um, the nation of Hawaii's uh, industrial uh, technological advisor. Yeah, mahalo Brandon, uncle. Um, I'm super honored to be here to uh, do important work here with Brandon and, and Uncle Bumpy every day. Um, so in staying in line with our Ahupua'a system and really this ancient infrastructure and in building a financial institution um, comes more opportunities. Um, and just one example in working with our partners at uh, Capital Bank is the tokenization of real life assets um, in the off-chain world into the on-chain world. And so this allows us to, um, to realize new forms of, of currency and to really um, start to account for some of the restoration work and the reconciliation work that's already happening here and has been happening here at the nation. And so um, this contributes to the economic sovereignty and independence that we're, uh, we're continually working toward uh, for our citizens. Um, so in the pillars that, uh, that represent connectography in our, in our, um, in our society and in, in the nation that we're building. Uh, the transportation pillar is, um, is a, is a primary, um, how, how would you describe that? Uh, yeah, it's the, it's the three pillars of the new sovereignty. Of the new sovereignty, right? Which is connectography. Connectography, right. Yeah. So in transportation, um, one of the ways that we're uh, evolving this is through something called Transit X. And so I'm working with a gentleman, he's a CEO, uh, Mike Stanley of Transit X Podway Technology uh, Systems. Uh, we've actually received some innovative um, models for uh, sustainable off-grid transportation that um, just uses the footprint of um, uh, Eastman's to actually install sustainable um, Podway systems. And so we've already received business plans for Kailua and Hawaii Kai, uh, in addition to an example of what these podways would look like here at our nation. Um, and so these pods um, in the current design system here would allow for one mile network with one pod, and it would actually bring mobility from the bottom of our network, or the bottom of our village all the way to the top. Um, and so this would allow us to, uh, to service and move things, move items, move people um, to and from different locations. And this technology can also help to um, alleviate some of the current transportation issue issues that we have in urban areas like Kailua um, and other areas around Hawaii. What Hana is? Uh, Hana is another area and uh, on Maui yeah. as well. And so, um, there's a lot of really interesting things that we can do, not only applying the technology to the research and um, some of the building we're doing here, but also different ways to access um, normally inaccessible places. And so that's the technology pillar. Moving on to energy. And so in thinking about uh, how to present this, you know, putting on the mindset of what our ancestors did and, and what we're currently doing, uh, fueling the future includes um, harnessing all the different uh, elements of the Ahupua'a system, including our sun, the water, and the wind. And so in working with Mercury Solar, Scott Sparkman, uh, he's the Nation of Hawaii's Minister of Energy. And, um, you know, with this leadership, we're working on building um, 400 amps of solar power to power this village here at the Pu'uhunua. And, um, and this Electricity is really important um, beyond, you know, giving us the lighting and electricity that we need to do this presentation. It's also uh, part of the infrastructure in, um, in connecting our community through, um, through our broadband, our community broadband network, which I'll talk a little about in a bit. Um, but that also includes us um, restoring the stream flow, um, utilizing Use a lot, utilizing the hydra and, and um, recognizing that the flow of the Ahupua system from the mountain to the ocean can also help us to realize uh, hydropower, including wind. Um, we currently have an energy ball wind turbine that's on site that um, is yet to be connected, but that's another way, another technology that we're uh, exploring to start harnessing uh, 
some of these natural elements. And then the third pillar of connectography is communications. And this is where a lot of my work comes in um, as a technical advisor in um, not only on the internet side, but also on the, the digital strategy side. And so we've been working closely with uh, the Internet Society, Mark Buell, uh, in starting the development of Hawaii's first community owned broadband network. And so what that means is here at the Nation of Hawaii, we, we currently have uh, a fiber driven network that is actually supported by us here. We are the internet service provider and um, in partnership with the Nation of, uh, with Internet Society back in 2019 for the Indigenous Connectivity Summit, we were actually able to install this um, broadband network here at the, the Nation of Hawaii, Pu'uhunua, Waimanalo. And so in building out this network, it involved the physical trenching to actually lay the fiber optic cable from the grid to the core. And before having access to the fiber optic, um, our entire community needed an upgrade uh, from the main road up to our up to our core so that we could actually run the fiber optic cable that we needed to power our network. Um, since launching in 2019, we've been fully documenting the setup and keeping troubleshoot shooting logs. And what this gives us is data on uh, not only how our village is connecting, how our citizens are connecting um, and how they're using the internet, but also some of the, um, some of the blueprint items to pay attention to in launching networks, community broadband network, networks like this in other indigenous communities and um, other parts of Hawaii, rural, rural areas. And so this all happens with um, partnerships um, with Bert Lum from DBED and um, the maintenance of this happens with um, some of the work that we're doing in Hawaii Broadband, Hui Working Group to, um, to keep this internet connection alive right now. Um, I would say that after about a year and a half, almost 24 months of service, uh, we're in a maturity, maturing capacity where we just expanded our network um, this past month, actually two months ago, to add up to 10 more subscribers to the network, bringing our total um, combined subscribership to, to 20 different subscribers uh, being served from two, two cell towers. And so, this broadband connection, uh, it really, not only does it give our citizens and, and it gives us connection here at the nation to be able to do these kinds of um, talks, but it also allows our citizens and, um, and the people who are living here in the village, the opportunity to attend classes and to continue to, um, to attend school, especially during COVID. And um, the internet became clutch um, during the lockdown because it actually allowed a lot of our citizens to continue work or to launch their own companies. Um, you know, and, and this is the work that's been happening here for the past 30 years, you know, and st sticking true to the Ahupua'a and understanding where the break in the blockchain is and working to restore um, that identity throughout, throughout the system that sustained our ancestors for so long. And so at the core of the Ahupua'a system is this idea of share abundance and aloha is the currency. And so um, we've actually developed a digital economy here called Exchange Avenue. That's a peer-to-peer -peer barter, barter and trade marketplace and mobile app that allows indigenous communities just like the nation of Hawaii and Pu'uhunua Waimanalo, um, a platform that's owned by us that allows us to barter and trade goods and services uh, without fiat currencies. And so um, this app launched 12 months ago. We received 20,000 in funding so far last year from uh, through an indigenous accelerator called the, uh, the Purple Prize. And we anticipate our first revenue this summer in 2021. Um, so these indigenous uh, Hawaiian inspired um, technologies are also being uh, launched in other areas such as New Mexico and Costa Rica, where they're looking at the idea of Ahupua'a and how it fits into their villages and um, seeing how they can utilize uh, the building that we've been doing here at the Nation of Hawaii to, um, to gain economic sovereignty in their, in their areas. In addition to the launch of Exchange Avenue, um, we've also been um, taking more active role in app development using no code platforms and that's fueling entrepreneurship and more digital literacy including the minting of, uh, of our first digital assets here uh, in NFT form, um, along with IoT sensors that, 
that allow us to measure soil health and temperature, not only here in the nation, but um, our community at large. And we can also start working with that data in, in building capabilities and uh, more talent uh, and more of a workforce around the communication infrastructure that's needed for us to, um, to continue to evolve. Yeah. And then this is a, a bird's eye view of our, of our current, well, of an, a network setup. This is a schematic that we actually put together that allows us to see where all of our connections are and see how they connect. And so much like Ahupua'a, you can see everything's flowing and everything's top down um, and, and efficient that way. And the next slide is just a visual of uh, some of the app development coming out of the nation of Hawaii. Uh, and, and so these platforms and communities that we're building um, all bring us to a more connected place and help to contribute to restoring the Ahupua'a to what it was. Yeah. And so in closing, um, you know, recognizing, uh, restoring and reconciling uh, what happened uh, to our Aupua system and to our people. And, um, you know, really the Nation of Hawaii's mission is to restore, maintain and preserve the sophisticated religion, language and culture that the Native Hawaiian people who prior to the overthrow lived in a highly organized, self-sufficient, subsistent social system that was based on communal land tenure. So this is the Nation, Nation of Hawaii mission statement um, from our website. Right, brother. Yeah. Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Nice. Thanks. And so mahalo. That's uh, that concludes uh, our talk today on the Nation of Hawaii and uh, the future of of our nation. And um, I want first of all, I was curious. I know you were talking about the the broadband. What kind of and I'm just going to hop in here okay. and see if anybody else has any other questions. What was like one of your main challenges of trying to set that up? What was like the number one challenge of trying to, to get that project moving? It, it, a, a lot of it, you know, believe it or not, it was political. Um, a lot of it, you know, back when we started and when we came up here to develop Pu'ono or Waimanalo, it was so far out there and, and our stance on sovereignty was so strong that a lot of the companies that were here from the overthrow, they didn't want to work with us. And that includes telecommunications companies, electric companies, all of these guys. So it took years and years of working within our community to develop relationships like the one we have with Bert Lom from the state of Hawaii. And so with his help and the help of the internet society, we was able to kind of bring Hawaiian Telecom along to actually go along with helping to develop this community broadband network. And now, you know, we're actually the, the, the example that, that the state of Hawaii is trying to model all community networks off of because of this relationship that we finally built with the state and with other companies that normally wouldn't have worked with us 20 years ago, but, but because of our, you know, innovative way of thinking and, and, you know, not being just, you know, problem oriented, but being solution oriented, trying to restore things. Um, we were able to develop this relationship and, and actually become Hawaii's first community broadband network. And so we're actually helping to um, the state of Hawaii, we're helping other organizations, other Hawaiian communities to develop other community networks all over Hawaii where you know they have problems actually connecting so yeah they're looking for data they need data mm -hmm. and you know our nation our village we live on the forest end of of the Aupua system so we're right there and it's the watershed so we're on the watershed that at you know 100 years ago used to provide this community um our system, our Aupua system with all the water. So it's, um, and it's a real, like. Um, so kind of taking like, you know, like the internet now, you know, we want to be like a provider of stuff like that, you know. Absolutely. That same mentality, yeah, that same Aupua mentality of leaving the flow open. The digital divide is bad. Uh, for urban, uh, for uh, rural communities, 
for old folks, you know, for, I mean, you know, some other countries that you know, I, I kind of believe that you know, we need to make sure that we can close the divide uh, because that is a right, that is a United Nations human right now. And there's actually two more questions too. If you can hear me fine, that would be great. Um, one of the questions that I have in the chat, do all of the Hawaiian people know about the Bank of America issue? Yeah, um, <laughs> not, not really actually. You know, it's, it's kind of um, an issue that, that, that is kind of gaining steam now you know, with the people that we reach, but there's so much people out there. There's so much Hawaiians that still, you know, need to learn more about it. And, and that's why we, you know, we're working with reporters now, we're working with others to kind of share that information. Cause you know, the reason why it hasn't been, you know, this commitment is still going is because Bank of America thinks that it's only a few guys that are keeping track of this when in actuality, more and more Hawaiians are gonna learn about this and more and more of them are gonna, you know, want reconciliation. And, and that's when the tide is gonna change and that's when they're gonna to come to the table to settle this. But we, we're working towards that. I think, you know what it is, it's not if the Hawaiian people know or not, generations of Hawaiians know about this. Almost 30 years of generation, they know. The problem was they bombed. Um, they've used time against us. And so with time comes new generations of people like Brandt, you know? It's a new generation of uh, coming in to fight the fight that we fought for the last 25 years. That's, that's time that, that's, so administrations change, you know? Uh, you know, and, and all of that stuff accumulated Looks like people don't know. So it's like a re-education of the same thing over 25 years ago, all over again. It's a repetitious thing. And that is what uh, banks use to wait out, especially not banks, but Bank of America, especially. That could be one of the, the, the things that is used. Same like land, land theft. Wait till they die. Soon as they die, move in. You know, you can start, you know, playing with the land and stuff like that. They, they wait for time. And somewhere along the line in time, because of survival, the families will settle with the people and sell their land. That's what's happened here. And um, I appreciate you letting us know about, you know, different perspectives of how many people in Hawaii know, I mean, or maybe just it's about exposure and promoting that exposure and becoming more aware in that, in that sense. Um, I have another couple of questions, if we have a little bit more time here. Um, one of the questions in the, in the chat is, can you say more about the business accelerator? Um, the follow-up the follow-up part to this question is I'm curious how you work to develop small businesses and how business education works in the Hawaii nation. Sure. So I mean, you know, I think the nation of Hawaii's efforts, we we build businesses in line with the way, the same way that uh, the curriculum that you just saw. So through the lens of Ahupua'a, and um, you know, we're recognizing people who I think naturally have a have a passion to build different technologies. You know, I've been working with different people here in the village who want to launch websites or who want to um, uh, improve their business their business structure and their business flow. And so some of those resources we're starting to um, to wrap into classes and workshops and um, thinking about ways that we can educate our our uh, our people here. Um, I think the businesses too are different projects that programs that we have and that we developing like the B apiary uh, sawmill lumber and saw uh, lumber and uh, milling wood uh, taking invasive species uh, with with the idea that you know um, they're cutting down a tree but then it's an invasive tree but we're turning that into value uh, by creating you know furniture to floral stuff to oil from the leaves that come out. 
and and when when you look at it uh, as a business, uh, that's one thing. But when you look at it from the perspective of a nation, like what we're developing, then everything under the nation is like wide open to develop, including the businesses, which is really important. But you know, today, like today, is a good example. Pandemic has, uh, you know. Time has closed mom and pop shops, but the pandemic has opened up uh, homes now. People are making goods and providing services from their home. And so it has created the pandemic in here, in, in Hawaii at least, it has created a self-sufficient subsistent system of economics. You know, cupcakes, cookies, you know, stuff stuff and, and plate lunches and, and things that that is you know actually putting a burden on the restaurants that got to open now because the customers went to another place right so i think here we have a lot of different stuff we have a lot of land for a lot of agriculture products and we we're growing the we're building that capacity so that we can really turn it into uh, and I mean, you know, it can be all kinds of stuff, all kinds of, you know. And then more information uh, is available at nationofhawaii.org. Uh, we'll also post this up there, this video there. Uh, information on our Eagle Foundation and uh, the historical chronology of the nation and um, yeah, news. And one, one more question um, uh, on the technology piece. Um, and it's just, a, it looks like it's maybe just a general question. Um, due to the new technology of broadband in Hawaii, are there still areas there without technology or, and they put in parentheses, the internet? And then, yeah, I'll just leave it at that first. Are there still areas without the internet in Hawaii? Yeah, there are. Um, a lot of areas that don't have internet access. And so this is one of the issues that we're hoping to help tackle with um, the broadband hui and the work that we're doing with uh, the state of Hawaii through Burt Lom is to helping to create uh, more community broadband networks in these areas that don't have internet access. So, you know, the, the, the beginning of, of what we started here at the nation is actually helping to spur on um, like, how uh, the head of state said we're, we're you know actively trying to close the digital divide because there is still a digital divide out there that is an obstacle that keeps a lot of our people um, away from economic op opportunities, political opportunities because we don't have internet access. So by us closing this digital divide, helping to create more community networks, uh, we're creating more uh, avenues for our people to actually exercise their economic, their political sovereignties. And so we're working on it and, um, you know, it's, it's happening. Well, you Absolutely. Are, it's kind of, you got to go at their pace, but if we was to work at our pace, we wouldn't solve this a lot quicker. Yeah, we actually, we, actually <laughs> we, we don't actually, we don't de depend on the state no. at all. And, and it's become a... a habitual thing, you know, over the years because of our stance uh, and using a law, using a law that they have no idea how to reconcile with native Hawaiians. So we just took it upon ourselves after trying to participate with the government for so long, to get upon ourselves to, to just do what they're not doing for us. Mm. And, and at least we start here and we, we go where we can and where uh, people ask us for help. We'll go there, no. you know, but we're not going to depend on the state government or the federal government for the kind of help that we can probably create, you know, with the relations like sharing with people that, that is on this, this Zoom call right now, you know, yeah. um, that's, that's the way, that's the way you can help us. Those are the first steps, absolutely. Or one of the many steps, of course, I should say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, I do want to say thank you so much, Brandon, Bumpy, John. Um, I would be curious to know how the apps turn out. So 
you know, I, is that it, those kinds of, is that information going to be on the nation of Hawaii? Because I'd be happy to check back in and see how that is going. Is that going to be on there or is that something where you have to download the app? You know, we can, we can link to, to some of the developments that we have and um, we'll, yeah. we'll fortify the information on the nation of Hawaii on the article when we re repost this, we'll have links as well. Okay. Um, it's continuing to evolve and grow and, you know, uh, maybe we can check back in with your community again in the future. Absolutely. We would love that. And again, thank you so much uh, for your time. And I'd like to thank all of the attendees for uh, coming today. And so many people in the chat are saying thank you and, um, and mahalo. And um, until the next time, thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Bye-bye.